Last time we talked about the simplest curves and, and surfaces in space, also known as lines and uh, planes. And today we'll talk about more, more complicated objects of the same kind, also curves and surfaces. Okay? So let me just briefly uh, remind you what we did last time. I know it's a warm September afternoon, and you want to be elsewhere, some of you, maybe, but you, you, will, you will get there. Just, you know, the sooner we start, the sooner we finish, okay? So I want to use, uh, from now on, I will be using this notation, R3 for the three-dimensional space. So R is for real numbers. And then uh, we write r to the n where for the n-dimensional space. So r2 would be the plane, and r3 will be the three-dimensional space. Okay. So oftentimes it will be convenient to just abbreviate instead of saying space. Now lines and planes in r3 can be can be uh, defined or represented in a very concrete way, which we discussed last time. For lines, it's a parametric form, which means that each of the three coordinates in R3 is written as a function of an auxiliary coordinate, which we call t, but it could be any other coordinate, any, any other letter you like. So let's use t. So then it, the, the formulas will be, look as follows. x is x0 plus at, and y is y0 plus bt. Z is Z0 plus CT, where these numbers are given. This are X0, Y0, and Z0, and ABC are given, and they correspond to the following. X0, Y0, and Z0 are coordinates of a particular point on this, on this line, and ABC is a particular vector which goes along this line. We call it direction vector. So that's A, B, C. So each of the coordinates is written as a function of t, and this tells us um, a parameterization, it gives us an explicit parameterization of this line. In other words, for each value of t, each value of t gives rise to a particular point on this line. For instance, t equals 0 corresponds to this point, t equals 1 corresponds to this point, and so on. Now, for planes, we did something different. For planes, we did something different. A plane doesn't have a direction vector, right? A plane is not determined by one direction, it's determined by two directions, or two vectors, like, like so. That's why it's a two-dimensional object. If it could be determined by one vector, it would be one-dimensional, like a line. So, in fact, if we wanted to imitate the same procedure for planes, we would have to choose two independent coordinates. We cannot parameterize the entire plane, which is a two-dimensional object, by one coordinate. We have to parameterize by two coordinates. Now, it's possible to do that. In fact, eventually, later in this course, we will, talk, we will be talking about parameterization of surfaces. But for now, we try to choose the, a more economical way. And a more economical way for a plane is, instead of writing a parametric form, to write down one equation. And for that equation, instead of trying to determine the plane by things which belong to it, we determine the plane by something which is orthogonal or perpendicular to it, by a normal vector. 
which is our favorite, my favorite image of this class so far. Okay? So very easy to remember. So that's a normal vector. So see, the point is that there are two vectors. There, there should be two independent vectors determining the plane, but it's also determined by one vector which is perpendicular to it. So the parametrization, instead of parametrization, we have one equation. And the equation has the form a times x minus x0 plus b times y minus y0 plus c times z minus z0 is equal to 0. And I'll draw it here. So that's the plane. And that's a normal vector. I draw it in a different color. It's not a direction vector, it's perpendicular. It's perpendicular to the plane. And that's why we call it n. We call it n, uh, a normal vector. And um, that's the vector ABC. So these are the data ABC, which are given the, the coordinates of the normal vector, components of the normal vector. And again, there is a particular point chosen, x0, y0, and z0 as before. You get, you get this equation by looking at the, by using dot product. So to derive this equation, you use the dot product. But at the end of the day, what you get is this, is this kind of equation. And this lets you write down, uh, describe mathematically, algebraically, describe a given plane once you know a point and, um, and the normal vector. And there are various ways in practice to find those data from the information which is available. For instance, a typical problem on homework is like this. Suppose you are given three points and that there is a unique plane. If the points are in generic position, there is a unique plane which passes through all of them. And the question is to write down an equation of this sort. How to do that? Well, you need one point and one, no and one normal vector. So you have three points, choose one of them. And then you need to find a normal vector. And you, know, you find a normal vector by taking a cross product of two vectors which belong to the plane, which you can easily find by subtracting coordinates of, this, of these points. So you, you get this n as a cross product of this guy and this guy. So that's the way you do it. You just obtain the information needed for this formula by using the information which is given. Are there any questions about this? OK, good. So what's next? So next, we'd like to understand um, more complicated objects in, in the three-dimensional space, in R3. And uh, we start with, uh, with, uh, with two-dimensional objects. So we want to look at more complicated, more complicated surfaces in R3. So the question is, what's the next example to consider? OK? So here we have a plane. We understand the planes very, fairly well. It's, a, it's a, very, a very simple equation. And so what's so what is an important feature of this equation? Well, if you look at this formula, it's actually a good idea to open the brackets. Sometimes it's a good idea to open the brackets and, and really think of this as a function of x, y, and z on the left-hand side. So if you open the brackets, let me do it on another board. If you open the brackets, you get ax plus by plus cz plus, you, you're going to get a combination of ax0 and so on, which I, will, I would like to conv convert into, in, in, into one symbol which I'll call D. So D is just negative AX0, negative Y, negative B, Y0, negative C, Z0. Okay? But it's kind of long, so, but, but the point is that all of these numbers are given. This are, all of them are given. So it is a number, unlike X, Y, and Z. Maybe, maybe uh, it's good to emphasize that by using different chart for this. 
So you want to see the, the very important point is these are variables. These are variables. And these are numbers. They are given. In any given problem, this will be some particular numbers. So 1, 2, 3, 5, whatever. Hmm? So we look at this. We look at this formula. And we see that on the left-hand side, the left-hand side is a function of three variables, x, y, z, of the simplest possible kind. Simplest possible kind means that each variable enters in degree at most 1, at most 1. So it's a polynomial of degree less of degree 1. It's a polynomial of degree 1. So what I'm trying to say is that suppose we were just, just for the sake of it, we were to try to write down various function in x, y, and z. So what are the simplest things that we could possibly write? Well, first thing is a constant function. It's kind of, this is sort of a trivial example in some sense. So constant function, or maybe just any number, not necessarily 1, you could write square root of 2 or pi or 3 or, or 10, whatever. But the point is it's a number. It, it's, not, it's independent of the variables. So that's the simplest function. At the next level, we've got x, y, and z. These are monomials in x, y, z of degree 1. Right? At the next level, we can form x squared, y squared, and z squared. And we can also have a mixed combinations like x, y, uh, x, z, and y, z. So these are monomials of degree 2. These are monomials. of degree 2. And these are of degree 1. And if you want, this is of degree 0. <laughs> and of course, you can continue. So next, you would write x cube, y cube, z cube. And then you'll have mixed terms of, diff of different kind. It's actually it's inter it's a very interesting question to see how, how the number of this independent monomial grows. Uh, as the degree grows, it, it actually grows very fast. It's going to grow very fast. So it's actually good, a good exercise to find a formula for the number of independent monomials. So you see here you have 1, then you have 3, then you have 6. What's the next number? So anyway, you don't have to do it now, but think about it. It's a good, it's a good question. So uh, if, we, if, we are, if we want to be methodical, one way to approach the question about general, general functions in three variables or uh, general surfaces in R3, which are essentially very close to questions which are close to each other, then we should start with the simplest ones, with, with surfaces defined by the simplest functions, and then progress and include more and more complicated ones. Of course, we're, we're not going to go all the way, you know, like 2, 3, 4, up to 10, but at least if we want to do the next possible example, we might as well just go to the next step, in, in the next level in this picture. So what we've done so far, and that's my point, is this, the first two levels. Because the most general expression, which involves these four guys, the constant function the, uh, mono and, the, and the monomials of degree 1, is precisely what's written on the left-hand side of this equation. So using that expression as an equation, you get the simplest possible equation that you can write on three variables. And sure enough, it gives you the simplest possible surface, namely a plane. So now, if you would like to continue and go to the next level, we should include polynomials, monomials of degree 2. Okay. And this way, we get what's called the quadratic surfaces, which is one of the subjects of today's lecture.
quadratic surfaces. So the idea is to include all monomials of degrees 0, 1, and 2. And that should be viewed as a natural generalization of the planes, which include all monomials of degrees 0 and 1. Okay. So the question is, what kind of surfaces do we get this way? What do they look like? So this should give us a good um, set of examples which uh, might be convenient in the future when we talk about general surfaces. We can test things. Not, we'll be able to test things not only by using planes, but also using those quadratic surfaces. That is the general idea. Now, another general idea is when you get a problem in R3, try to do it in R2 or maybe even R1. In other words, if you get a problem in a three-dimensional space, try to look at a kind of a baby version of that problem in a smaller dimensional space, which would be, in this case, a plane. The prob this problem is already meaningful, or a similar problem is already meaningful in R2. So look at, let's look at, look first at the analogous problem In R2, we only have two variables, x and y. Okay? And so it's easier to analyze what are the corresponding curves. I remind you that in R2, because it's two-dimensional, if we impose one equation, we are going to end up with a one-dimensional object. Because 2 minus 1 is 1. Right? So in R2, we can also impose one equation. Of the form linear combination of all monomials of degree 0, 1, and 2. So that would be x squared. Let me keep using the red, uh, the red color. x squared, y squared. And then you've got x, y. And then you also have a constant. So you'll have some a, x squared, plus b, y squared, plus c, x, y. Uh, sorry, and you, of course, you also have the, the ones of degree 1. So you have plus x. Um, so it'll be some d plus some e, y plus some a, b, c, d, e, f. So it's a little bit easier because there are fewer, fewer monomials in two variables. You see, you only have two of degree one, and you only have three of degree, of degree two, as opposed to three and six, respectively, in dimension three. So what, what does this represent? What does this equation represent? Well, the point is that it looks like there are too many possibilities because there are seven free parameters, a, b, c, d, e, uh, uh, six par seven param uh, six parameters, right? Six parameters, OK. So too many, right? But of course, the, let's, let's, let's think about it this way. We can always, if, for example, we, we can combine some expressions into a square, then we can always say that by changing variables slightly, we will get, we will eliminate some, some, some parameters. So what I mean to say is the following. Say. This is something that we looked at before when we talked about circles. Suppose you have an equation like this, x minus 1 squared plus y plus 2 squared equals 1, right? So if you open the brackets, you end up with like x squared minus 2x plus 1 plus y squared plus 4y plus 4 equals 1. So you know, then you bring, you bring the terms, and so it's like x squared minus 2x plus Ah, let's write first the second degree. Uh, 
uh, plus y squared minus 2x plus 4y. And then you have 1 plus 4 minus 1, so plus 4. So see, this is an expression like this. The only thing, it's, it's almost like a most general expression, except there is no term with xy. But you've got x squared, y squared, x, and y. You see, it looks, very, it looks quite complicated. But the point is that if you complete uh, the, this, if you complete this to a square and this to a square, you actually end up with something much more manageable because we can say, let's introduce new coordinates, x prime, which is x minus 1, and y prime, which is y plus 2. Okay? Then, if we do that and substitute, then we actually then we actually will end up with x prime squared plus y prime squared equals 1. And that's a circle, right? That's a circle of radius 1. But with respect to these new coordinates, so what does it mean for the original problem? Well, for the original problem, it simply means that we have shifted the origin in the, in the xy plane. This is the original xy plane. And uh, we introduce new coordinates, x prime and y prime. So for example, when x is 1, that corresponds to x prime equals 0. So what we've done is we've introduced new, a new coordinate system by just simply shifting the, the old axis. We've shifted the y axis by 1 because now this, this is x equal 1. But x equals 1 corresponds to x prime equals 0. And likewise, we have the second line here, which corresponds to y equals negative 2, which is nothing but y prime equals 0. So we've got a new coordinate system with new coordinates x prime and y prime. right? And the point is that the circle, this is the equation of the circle in this new coordinate system, where the circle has as the center the origin of this new coordinate system. So it looks like this. That's the circle we're talking about. But if we can understand it in the new coordinate system, that surely, then surely we understand it in the old coordinate system. Because what it means simply uh, is that it is a, still a circle, but it's a circle centered instead of the origin of the old coordinate system, centered at the point, at the point, let me write it in white, emphasizing that these are the coordinates in the old coordinate system, uh, uh, 1 and 2, 1 and negative 2, the center. Do you see what I mean? Are there any questions about this? By, by choosing s slightly better coordinates, you get a much better expression for, for your equation. Okay? So then the question is really not so much to understand what each of these equations gives rise to, but what is the simplest form to which we can bring this equation by making a similar coordinate change. So what kind of coordinate changes are allowed? First of all, shifts are allowed, like this. x goes to x minus 1, y goes to y plus 2. That certainly is, should be allowed because, I mean, we don't lose anything. Clearly, we can work with this coordinate system in as much as we can work with this coordinate system. The other thing which we should allow is rotations, rotations of the plane, which would mean the following. You have, this is your original coordinate system, and say you rotate it by 30 degrees, pi over 6, and uh, you end up with this coordinate system. So again, this is not such a big deal because, you know, think about it. If you look at like this, you see this coordinate system. But if you look like this, you get this one. So it's the same thing. It just depends on your point of view. They are equal. It's just, uh, it's, uh, we shouldn't approach things with prejudice and say that uh, it has to be like this because none of, there, there's no reason to say that this coordinate system is better than this one. Well, th there is an important point that when we rotate, when we rotate, we preserve the angles and distances. So the essential uh, characteristics ge of geometry are preserved. And in, in this sense, we should not really worry too much if we can get a better shape of the equation by making a rotation. So all of this was to say that even though the original equation, if you write it in the most general form, looks very complicated, you can choose, you can always choose a nice coordinate system to bring it to a much simpler form. 
And so what are these simpler forms that we can get? We call it, we call it sometimes the canonical form. So the canonical form for um, some other variables in other words there will always exist some variables in which you will get the canonical form now those variables would would be more appropriate to call x prime and y prime but I don't want to make a formula look too heavy so I will use again x and y even though with respect to the original equations this will not be x and y but it will be some x prime and y prime okay so what are the what are the what are the possibilities? The first possibility looks like this. x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals 1. This is something we have encountered before when we talked about curves on the plane. This is, an, this is what's called an ellipse. Because see, the point is, we surely know very well what the picture looks like if a and b are both equal to 1. It's again the circle of radius 1 which we keep talking about, right? which we understand very well. What we've done now is we've divided the coordinates x and y by a and b, which simply corresponds uh, geometrically to kind of squishing or expanding, depending on whether a is less or, or greater than 1, expanding the picture along that axis. So the result of this is not a circle, but something which you get sort of a, a squished circle. Let's, let me draw. Let me draw a picture for it. This, this is what it will look like if A is greater than B. If A is less than B, it will be squished in this way. And in this picture, this is A, and this is negative A, and this is B, and this is negative B. Why? Because if you substitute x equal 1, you get from this term, you get 1. And then you substitute y equals 0, and you get the equation. So surely this point belongs to it. And for the same reason, this point belongs to it. And similarly, if x is 0 and y is plus or minus b, these two points, we also get an equality. So that's an ellipse. Now, the second, the second way, the second possibility is The second possibility is uh, like this, x squared over a minus y, a squared minus y squared over b is equal to 1. And that's, that's, that's called a hyperbola. Hyperbola. Squared. So what does it look like? You see, again, I can plot uh, a point uh, where it intersects the x-axis. I can take a here, and I can take negative a. And see, this is great, because if you take a squared over a squared minus 0, this is 1. So this is like those points. But you cannot do the same as before, because if you substitute b, instead of y, you get b squared over b squared, but you, get, you have a negative sign. So this is a key difference. Um, here you have plus. And actually, I would emphasize that here you have plus in both terms. And here you have minus. And because you have minus, you have minus here. And so this is not equal to 1 anymore. It's equal to negative 1. Right? So those two points will not show up. And in fact, instead, what the, what, the, what the curve will look like, it will look like this. Now, if you think that you're not familiar with this, you're mistaken. You are familiar. And because we have studied hyperbolas. And hyperbolas, but usually we write hyperbolas by the equation y equals 1 over x, or maybe some coefficient 
you know, C over X. You see, what we used to call hyperbola before is given by this equation. It's a graph of the function 1 over x. Right? This is y, y equals 1 over x. Ah, the way I drew it, it looks like it's going to intersect the x axis, but it's not, right? It's, it's called what, it's what's called asymptotic. So the, the, we have, there are two asymptotic lines to this graph, which are the coordinate axis. So this is a very familiar picture. So what's the connection between this picture and this picture? To, 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 to understand this connection, let me, ch let me talk about the special case when a and b are equal to one, and the general case is very similar. When a and b are equal to one, what this looks like is y squ x squared mi minus y squared equals 1. And now here's a trick. I can write this as x minus y times x plus y. You see? And now I'm going to perform a kind of transformation that I talked about here. Namely, I will choose new coordinates, x prime, which is uh, x, neg x minus y, and y prime, which is x plus y. <coughs> and if you make this transformation, then this equation becomes x prime times y prime is equal to 1, which is the same as to say that y prime is 1 over x prime, which is our old equation for the hyperbola. So you see, at first glance, there is no connection whatsoever between this formula and this formula. But there is a connection, and you do realize this connection by using this transformation. Now, what does this transformation represent? This transformation actually represents rotation by 45 degrees. I'm simplifying things a little bit, uh, because actually what it is, it's not just rotation, but also uh, um, uh, it's a composition of the rotation by 45 degrees, and also multiplication of everything by, uh, by a factor of square root of 2. So there is a square root of 2 here, which is due to the fact that the cosine and sine of pi over 4 is 1 over square root of 2. But it's, it's, it's beside the point here. Let's not worry about this. It's a, it's a minor issue at the moment. What is important is that there is a the, if I make a transformation like this, which is a rot essentially rotation by 45 degrees, I bring this form to this form. Okay. And so that's the power of this kind of transformations, which it allows you to, to relate equations which at first glance look, look very different. But in this particular case, we can actually use, we can use this transformation to take advantage of our knowledge from before, our knowledge of the hyperbola, to understand what the graph, what, sorry, what this curve looks like in this case. Because what it looks like is just the old hyperbola rotated by 45 degrees. And if you rotate it by 45 degrees, that's exactly what you get. Rotate this, that picture is a rota rotation of this picture by 45 degrees clockwise. Yes? Why is it clockwise? Because you have to, when you look at this formula, you have to explain why this rotation by 45 degrees and not by negative 45 degrees. So this is something, by the way, which is a subject of another mathematical course called Math 454. And I know that some of you may have taken it or are planning to take it. So that's a course where this kind of stuff will be discussed in a very systematic way. Here, we're not going to um, really uh, dwell on it too much. I'm just giving you uh, this as an example of the advantages of changes of coordinates and also by way of explaining why this picture will appear if you want to study that equation. This is the explanation, because I have reduced the question of, of drawing this curve to the question of drawing this curve, which we already knew. Okay. So these are not the only possible cases. These are not the only possible scenarios for, um, for these quadratic curves. This is case two. So there is another important case, which I'll call case three.
you see, the point is that up to now, in the left-hand side, I only had monomials of degree 2, x squared and y squared. I did not have monomials of degree 1. And the third case is a case when you do have monomial of degree 1. And that's the case when you have, uh, which I'll write like this, y uh, plus Minus. It doesn't, in this case, it doesn't matter. Y plus x squared over, over a squared is equal to 0. And now that's, that's also something which we know very well. That's a parabola. Because I actually wrote it in such a way that we can, we can quickly re recognize here the graph of a function minus x squared over a squared. So. And um, so that's this, parab this, that's this parabola. And also, if you want, you, also, you, can, you can add the other one where you would have y minus x squared over a, a squared equals 0. So that's the parabola. So this is red, and this will be yellow. That's this one. Because that's like y equals x squared over a squared. So two parabolas, one going upward, the other one going downward. Uh, in some sense, you can argue that these two equations are also equivalent because you can get one equation from the other by flipping the sign of y. If you put negative y, it's the same as putting a minus sign here. So it becomes a subtle issue as to which coordinate changes do you allow. Do they have to preserve orientation or not? So I don't want to get into this. So if you want to think think that there are two different cases, subcases here, parabola pointing upward and parabola pointing downward. So this had a, this had a generic, this had a generic quadratic surface, quadratic curves, I'm sorry, because we are on the plane, so these are quadratic curves. These are not all, of course, because if I really insist, if I really insist on the most general equation like this, I might as well take an equation in which there are no quadratic terms whatsoever and there are only linear terms. But if I do that, I go back to the case of degree 1 or degree 0 and 1 more precisely, and that's the case of a line. So I end up with a line. We have already discussed lines. So um, we're not losing any generality here by assuming that actually there are some non-trivial quadratic terms in the equation. Then you get one of those three cases. So all of this was by way of illustrating what we are up against now when we would like to understand a similar, uh, similar question in, in, uh, in space, in R3 instead of R2. You see, in R2, it's easier to explain. There are only th there are these three cases. But now we need to generalize it to the case of the three-dimensional space, which was our original problem. After all, right now we are dealing with R3, and we're trying to understand curves and surfaces in R3. This was a good digression, though, anyway, because it also gave us some useful information about curves on the plane. So in R3, we have to also include, include um, our third variable, z squared, which will also give rise to, um, to the two cross terms like this, um, xz and yz, with some coefficients. So it will be some. A, B, C, D, E, F, um, G, and H, and K. And then there will be some uh, linear term. So there's a whole bunch of additional terms, additional terms we, we have to include. However, as I already explained, in, in the case of a plane, we want to transform this equation to the simplest possible form. And in, on the plane, we get these three ca cases. And on, in space, we are going to get the following cases, which I'm going to explain now. Okay? So again, uh, transform to a nicer expression by using a different coordinate system. So that would be a kind of a canonical form. Canonical form for a quadratic surface. So what are these canonical forms? Mm -hmm. 
they look very similar. They look very similar to what we had on, on the plane. The first few the first few cases. First few cases will be just like on the plane. On the left hand side, we're going to get a, have a sum of squares or a combination of squares with different with different signs, plus or minus. So the first one is when all signs are plus. And um, it's very easy to understand what this is, just like the way we understood, just the way we understood uh, the ellipse. Because there's a special case which we understand very well, a special case when A is B is and B and C are all equal to one. Then we get the equation x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 1. And that, of course, is a sphere of radius 1, which is centered at the origin. This is something we discussed before. So we already know sphere. So when I said we only know planes, I actually wasn't, it wasn't quite, quite true. We, we, know, we, we already talked about spheres. So the sphere is a special case of this. But not only is it a special case of this, but this is a case which will help us to understand the general case the way we were able to derive the ellipse from a, uh, from a circle. Because what we see is that now, by dividing these coordinates by A, B, and C, we have basically just squished our sphere in a certain way in each of the three, or expanded, if you will, depending on whether A, B, and C are greater than one or less than one. We have shrunk or expanded the sphere in each of the three directions. And so what you get it kind of is a kind of a, it's a kind of an egg, I don't know, right? So that, that's, that's, a, that's a surface that's called an ellipsoid. You take the, you take the names for the quadratic curves and you, 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 you change the, the SE at the end by SOID. No, not S. Anyway, you, you, you change the end by OID. That's, that's how the terminology will be formed. So you have ellipsoid hyperboloid, and paraboloid. Oh, by the way, I forgot to say to write that this is a parabola. And we'll get paraboloids in, in space. Okay, so what, what does it look like? It looks like this. It looks like a sphere. Well, to be able to draw this, you have to know how to draw a sphere to begin with. And then you kind of try to squish to squish everything a little bit, right? I don't know. That's my interpretation. This is a kind of a contemporary art interpretation of, a, of an ellipsoid. Think of an egg. Uh, but the egg is not quite uh, symmetrical, usually. But this has a higher degree of symmetry. Uh, OK, I will, not do, I will not try to make it better. You, 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 you do it. You try. You try to get a better picture. I think it's pretty. I, th I think it's pretty clear. So what's next? Well, clearly, just by analogy, with with uh, with a, with a two-dimensional case, we need to allow some of the signs to be negative. Okay, and then there are there are several options. You see, you've got you've got yourself three signs, in front of x squared, in front of y squared, in front of z squared. And so you can play with them any way you like. And so let's see what the results are. So you've got z squared now over c squared, and this is equal to 1. Now, that the, the point is, the, the problem is, in two dimensions, we only had two choices, plus or minus. You see, at first glance, it looks there are two more choices, because you could have minus plus or minus minus. But if you have minus plus, it's the same as this one, uh, plus minus, if you just relabel the variables, x and y. If you just relabel the variables. So it's not essentially new. That's number one. Number two, you cannot have minus minus, because minus x squared minus y squared, well, even if you divide by whatever, a squared and b squared, this is going to be negative always, or 0. It will never be equal to 1. And on the right-hand side, we purposefully put 1. 
So we exclude that possibility that all of them are negative. So some of them have to be positive and some of them have to be negative. And what counts really is not which ones are which, but how many pluses and how many sines, uh, uh, minuses. Here, all three are pluses. So the two remaining cases are when, when, um, when there are two pluses and one minus. So that's sort of like case two um, point one. And then you have the case 2.2, which is where when you have one plus and two minuses. So that would be x squared over a squared um, plus minus. Sorry. So this is plus always, and it's minus, minus, and minus. And so the question is, what do you get in those cases? And here, to analyze, to analyze this, what is useful is to, to consider what's called sections. I will illustrate this notion in the case of an ellipsoid, even though my drawing is not that great. But I, I will try to, to explain this. So see, this is, a, this is a surface, which is like a sphere. You know what? Let's just look at the sphere. Maybe it's better. So that I can emphasize the most important aspect of a section without straining our eyes with, a, with an ellipsoid. So a sphere, so this is our coordinate system. Okay? And this is a sphere. Let's see if I can do it. So this is a circle, and this is like, this is like the, the equator, and this is the equator on the other side. It's more or less looks like a like a like a sphere. Okay, so that's a sphere. So now, what is what exactly is this equator? What exactly is the equator? I claim that the equator is nothing but what you get by intersecting the sphere with the x y plane. Remember, this is the x y plane. If you if you cut the sphere with the x y plane, what you'll get is precisely this equator. So the original equation was x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 1. Now cut by the plane, by the xy plane, and the equation of the xy plane is z equals 0, right? It's xy plane, so x and y could be arbitrary, but z is equal to 0. xy plane, but z is equal to 0. So if you cut by z equals 0, it simply means that you substitute z equals 0 into the equation and so you end up with the equation x squared plus y squared equals 1. And that's a circle. And sure enough, we see that that's the equator which we are used to, which we uh, knew was there to begin with. Now, the interesting point is you, you can cut by other, surf, other planes as well. We can cut by a plane, for example, z equals 1 half. So that's a plane which is parallel to the xy plane, but it's just, it sits a, a little bit above it at the height of 1 half. When we do that, we are going to cut a smaller circle, which is like one of the, if you think about this as the, as the Earth, as the, glo as, a, as the globe, this will be the uh, parallel, one of the parallels. And so on. So, you, so that you can think of, uh, in fact, you can think of a sphere, of the entire sphere, as a collection of those sections. As you, you can cut by those, you can slice it by those planes, and each time you slice it, you end up with a circle. So if we didn't know what the sphere looked like, we could just imagine the collection of those slices and kind of put them together. Into, it's like if you don't know what the loaf of bread looks like, but you have a collection of, of the slices, you can kind of reconstruct in your mind what the bread must have looked like by kind of imagining those slices on top of each other. Or, or side, by, side by side. So that's the idea of understanding surfaces. You have to realize that the surface is really a collection of curves. Those curves are obtained by slicing it by parallel planes. For example, z equals a constant. Or instead of z equals a constant, you could slice it by x equals a constant or y is equal to constant. And that's the way we can analyze this picture. And each time we slice it, each time we slice it, we are going to end up with a curve. And that curve will be one of those familiar curves which we have already discussed. 
So this is the way to understand what those surfaces look like. You try to, to see what, what the sections, what the slices are, and recognize, uh, you recognize the slices simply because you have already, um, you have already understood what, what the quadratic curves look like. So, but I don't want to spend the whole hour explaining to you uh, every detail of this, so I'll just give you the answer. I will just draw you a picture, what it looks like. And then I will justify it by a similar argument. Okay? So the first one, the first one that I will draw will be the picture for, for the case 2.1, where the case 2.1, where you have two pluses and one minus. Okay? So what does it look like? I claim that it looks as follows. Um, so this is a parabola which I had before. This is a parabola. And then I rotate this parabola around um, around the z-axis. <coughs> so it's going to look like this. Like this, and like this, and like this. OK, you get the idea. And the reason is very simple. So of course, I mean the usual coordinate. I don't want to, to draw the coordinate system on top of it, because it, it's already pretty messy, so I don't want to make it more messy. So I'll just draw it on the side. But you sh should think that, well, the z-axis is here. I'll just, let me just draw the z-axis. This is the z-axis. But so this is z, x, x and y. It's the usual coordinate system. This is the z-axis. So how do I know that it's like this? Well, the point is, if you substitute some value of z, you see it's, it's going to be minus z squared over c squared equals 1. But then I take it to the side, so I get 1 plus z squared over c squared. So I get some positive number. And I get the equation x squared divided by a squared plus y squared divided by b squared is equal to this. And I already know that that, that is an ellipse. So that means that my surface is going to be a collection of ellipses, which the smallest, which the smallest size will be when z is equal to 0. And then it sort of grows in size when z becomes larger, positive num large positive number or large negative number. So that's how I know. And finally, I can also look at the, I can slice it by, by a zx plane. And when I slice it by zx plane, that means I set y equals 0. And then I, I recognize the hyperbola. So in this picture, you recognize two old pictures at the same time. You recognize two old pictures. One is an ellipse. That's an ellipse which you get by setting z equals 0 ellipse. But you also recognize in this picture a hyperbola, which you get by setting by setting um, x is equal to 0. And that's a hyperbola. Is hmm? is well, it's not really a circle because at z equals 0, I'm going to get x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals 1. Right? And we have already decided that this is an ellipse. It's almost like a circle. And for the purposes of this diagram, of this picture, you know, in, in the approximation which I use, it, it looks like almost like a circle. But we have to realize whenever, whenever I draw a circle, I include all, all possible ellipses as well. Because they, all, they, all, they look so much alike. An ellipse and a hyperbola look very different. So then I would not mistake one for the other. I should not mistake one for the other. But an ellipse and, and, a, and a circle in first approximation is almost the same. So in my picture, I will not distinguish between them. So this is a, this is a surface which combines an ellipse and a hyperbola. And that's why it's called an, an, uh, an elliptic hyperboloid. 
elliptic hyperboloid. That's right. So I was going to keep it in suspense because then I was going to make another one and say, what are we going to do? Because we have two different names, but now you spoil it, so it's okay. It has one sheet, which it's, it's connected. There are no, this is just one piece. And so then this already suggests that the second, in the second case, we actually are going to get more than one. So we're going to get, in the second case, we are going to get um, um, we're going to get two, two pieces, two sheets. So in the second case, I'll just draw the picture without, expl without explanation, but explanations are obtained the same way. So in the second case, you see, I have, I'm going to have two, I'm going to have two parabolas, sorry, two hyperbolas. X, Y, and X, Z, I'm going to have hyperbolas. And um, so it's going to look, let me see what's the best way to draw it. Mm -hmm. Y, Z. Okay. Y, Z. going to be like this. So it is like taking a hyperbola and rotating it, but in a different way. Like this. So uh, Z and Y. That's right. That's right. So, um, so this is easy. now actually I, I will draw the coordinate system because it's not going to mess up the picture too much. So this is x, y, z. So this is a hyper. These two things are hyperbolas. This and this are the two. Um, branches of the hyperbola, which is, um, it, it includes z and y. Oops. I know, I didn't do it right. I didn't do it right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And you can tell. It's in, uh, what I did, what I wanted to do, you see, what you have what, in my picture, x and z, if you look from the point of view of x and z, then you get ellips, ellipses. So x and z should have the same sign, and not, so it's like this. All right. So the hyperbola, the hy this hyperbola is in the zy plane. So to get it, I have to, I have to just retain the z and y part of the picture, and that's y squared. Did I get, and I, well, okay, I got this part right, okay, at least, that's good. So this is x equals zero. You see, so this is, this is the case when x is equal to zero. I just said x equals zero, I get this. And that equation is, is this red, is a red one. That's this one. Okay. Again, I will not. I don't have time to explain every detail of this. So you'll have to figure this out. Why it's, why it's like this? And I will draw you one more picture, because we have to also tackle paraboloids. And there are there are two types of paraboloids: an elliptic paraboloid and uh, and a hyperbolic paraboloid. An elliptic paraboloid is kind of easy. It's just like rotating the parabola around the z-axis. But the really cool one is, is the hyperbolic paraboloid. And 
But that one is the hardest one to draw. And I used to, I used to do very good pictures of that one. Let's see I can, if I can do it. Okay. Let me just let me just draw it and then we'll move on. That's one. Then you've got another one. Just like this. There you go. Then like this. <coughs> and now you do. And now you do this. You see? So it's like this. So it's like a saddle. You see, there's a saddle point. You see what I mean? It's not so bad, huh? Thank you. <laughs> so anytime, anytime you need a hyperbolic parabola, just call me. Except, except on, on the exams. OK. I will, not, I will not make you do it, so don't worry. All right, but you, you should be able to vi visualize it. So that's, that's a hyperbolic paraboloid. Now, so you see the, the upshot of all this is that we get a, a, a whole variety of surfaces by simply going from equations involving just degree one monomials to equations which involve degree two monomials or and lower. And so that's a very interesting um, that's a very interesting example which kind of indicates the variety, the huge variety of surfaces that we have in three-dimensional space. Okay, so that's that's what we wanted to, to, to see uh, in the case of surfaces. Okay? And now we go back to, to curves. Again, the whole um, the whole game that we are playing here in, in the three space, in the three-dimensional space, is, uh, is a kind of interplay between surfaces and curves. And uh, you have a question. So what's the equation that makes that? What's the equation that makes that? OK, let's see. So this is, this actually, I, I'm glad you asked, because, because otherwise we're kind of missing the punchline. So that's the way it is right there. So x, y, z. So it's something which should look like um, so first of all, it should something which should look like a parabola in this direction. If I look on the x, y, and it should look like, um, sorry, this, this should be a hyperbola. This is a parabola, and this is a parabola. So first of all, I want to have z, and I want to have, um, in the y plane, I want to have, let me try different colors to kind of indicate to you. So this, this green, OK? This green, green stuff is nothing but y equals, y, sorry, z equals y squared. Let's forget about this ABC, the coefficients. We can, we can divide by those coefficients later. I'll just, I'll just write, uh, write, uh, write down the rough formula for it. So this is z equal y squared. So that should be part of the equation, this one. Right? This is like the parabola. I, I still haven't erased it. It's right there. What else do we have? We have this part of the picture which is also parabola, which is also parabola, this one, is, but it lies in, um, so this one was in the zy plane, and this is going to be in the xz plane, you see. In the xz plane. Uh, maybe I didn't draw the, I didn't draw this coordinate in a nice way. Uh, let me do it slightly. This like this. I'm actually drawing it like this. So that's that's the um, that's the uh, z equals negative x squared. And so what it means is that you should have z, right? You should have z. You should have negative y squared, and then you have x. You should have x squared. 
That's what, you sh that's what it should be. But um, because, see, this, what I did is if I set x equals 0, if I set x equals 0, I get this one. So I get this equation, z equals y squared. And if I set a y equals 0, I get z is equal to minus x squared. So that's all good, right? And so, and so finally, if I set if I set z equal some constant, I'm going to get I'm I'm going to get hyperbolas. So that's the, that's roughly the equation. I'm, I'm not being precise, but this is roughly the equation. So it has a z and it has x squared and y squared, but but it's with opposite signs. Okay. Now, so so the next topic that we'll discuss is. Um, general curves, more general curves in space. Okay. So more general curves in space, and again, just like just like for just like for lines, we parameterize them. Instead of writing equations, Because now the curve has dimension, dimension of the curve is one, right? So that means we need one parameter, but two equations, or two equations, because the curve lives in three-dimensional space. So each time we write an equation, we dimension drops by one. It has to drop from 3 to 1. Therefore, we have to write two equations. But if we use parameters, we need only one parameter. So it's more economical to use parameterization instead of writing down equations. So we introduce a new, a new auxiliary parameter, which usually we call Usually we call it T, but we don't have to. We can call it S or theta, whatever, whatever letter you like, just as long as it's different from the three variables x, y, z. And we write x equals f of t, y equals g of t, and z equals h of t. And of course, we recognize, that recognize two, two special cases here. One special case is like this. When you don't have the third equation, the third formula, you only write x equals f of t and y is equal to g of t. That would be a parametric curve on the plane. And we also recognize as a special case the case of a line where f of t is a linear function And so are G and, and, and H. So in a sense, when we are, when we are getting lines uh, in three space, we are also doing the simplest possible parametric functions, F, G, and H, the functions which involve only the constant term and the degree one term in the coordinate T. Now, there is, uh, there, is one, uh, there is one terminological issue which I want to emphasize. When I say equations, I mean equations just involving x, y, and z. You see? Because someone can say, well, this, is, this also looks like an equation. So what do I mean when I say you need one parameter or two equations? Here, I'm actually writing th down three equations. That's a terminological issue. I don't think of this as equations.
because an equation is, is something which is a constraint on, on the variables which are given to you. And this, this formula involves not only the coordinates which are given, x, y, z, but also some auxiliary coordinate. Okay? So this is not, these are not equations. Well, they are equations in some sense, but they are not, these are not what I mean by equations. By equations, because they involve involve t, an additional variable, additional variable, or what we call parameter. You see, that's why I would like to think of this as parameterization. I parameterize x, I parameterize y, I parameterize z. I'm not writing down equations on x, y, z. An equation, on the other hand, is like this. This is an equation. This is an equation. It only involves x, y, and z. There are no additional variables. Like t. You see, that's the difference. So is that clear? So don't be confused when I say, when I say equation, I don't mean formula like this. I mean formula like this, which involves only the given. Now, someone can say, we can actually interpret this an, as an equation, but on four variables. Because you can think of this now as a system of equations on variables x, y, z, and t, which is actually another way to think about this. In other words, instead of starting in three-dimensional space and trying to parameterize a curve by one parameter, you can think that what you are doing is that you are working in a four-dimensional space and you're imposing three equations. Because you can look at the four-dimensional space with coordinates x, y, z, and t, and then you can impose these equations. And you see everything is consistent because this way you start with a four-dimensional space and you impose three equations. So what's the dimension of the object? It's 4 minus 3, because now there are three equations, which is 1. So it's all consistent. You get, again, 1 as the dimension of your object. But I prefer not to think of this expression as a system of equations in a larger dimensional space, namely in four-dimensional space. I would rather prefer to think of this as a way to parameterize my, my, my curve by this auxiliary parameter, auxiliary coordinate. Any questions about this? This is really a terminological issue, but I wanted to emphasize it because I keep saying parameterization, equations, and so on. And, and so I do realize that it could be confusing. OK. So what can we do with this more general? What can we do with this more general parametric curves? Well, we look at, we try to recall what we did with uh, parametric curves on the plane. And we try to do the same thing here. And one of the things we did was we wrote down equations for the tangent lines to these curves. And that's what, that, that's what we'd like to do for curves in the three-dimensional space. So let me... Um, Let me do it as by way of, of doing an exercise or an example. Find parametric equation to the curve. Sorry, parametric equation, I, I skipped two words, of the tangent line. of the tangent line to the curve given in parametric form as follows. x is equal to 1 plus 2t. y is equal to 1 plus t minus t squared. And z is equal to 1 minus t plus t squared minus t cubed. 
OK? Uh, at, at the point, at the point, 1, 1, 1. So how to do this problem? The first thing you need to do is to check whether this, this point actually belongs belongs to this belongs to this um, to this curve. You see, in this case, it clearly does, right? Because this point. This point corresponds to the value t equal 1. Sorry, t equals 0. If t is equal to 0, we get 1, 1, and 1 for, all, for each x, y, and z. So this, of course, is a necessary condition because if it's not, like, it's not satisfied, if, if there is no parameter t for which you get precisely those coordinates, it means that there is a there is a misprint in the problem, and so then you cannot really do it. It's not self-consistent. So the first step is to find the value of t. Step one is to find the value of t which corresponds to this point. And the way you find it is by solving the equation. For example, here it will be 1 plus 2t is equal to 1, which gives you t is equal to 0. And then you hope. You, you, you expect that the, if the problem is correct, that if you plug that solution to the, to the formulas for y and z, you will get uh, the, the right values. In general, it could be that there are, there's more than one solution that you get from the first equation. So then you have to, to find which one will correspond to this point. In other, one, in other words, for which value of t will you will actually get that particular point. It could happen also that there are two different values of parameter t which give you the same point. That's called self-intersection. We've seen that when we, when we were graphing um, curves, especially by using polar coordinates. So that's also possible. But if, if that's how it happens, then the question would be find parametric equations of the tangent lines, not just tangent line. Because in this case, there will be two different tangent lines. right? This one and this one. So the question indicates that actually the, this point is not a point of a self-intersection, but rather it's a point like this where you actually have a well-defined unique tangent line. OK, so that's step one to figure this out. Step two is to write down the equation of the line. And now we have to remember what information we need to write down the parametric representation for a line in three space. We need a point, and we need a, a direction vector. And fortunately we, fortunately, we already have a point, 1, 1, 1. We already have the point. So we need a direction vector. for this line. And the direction vector is going to be a tangent vector to this curve. And we find it in the same way in which we found it for curves in, on the plane, by taking derivatives, by taking derivatives um, of our functions at, for this value. So in general, the formula is that you take f prime of t0, g prime of t0, and h prime of t0, where t0 is your value. Right? So we, we simply have to differentiate each of the three functions and substitute, OK, it's 5 o'clock. Let me take one minute, because there is one uh, important point, and I don't want to, to lose it. So you see, your, your curve is already, 
your curve is already given by parameterization of some variable t. And now you're going to write an equation for a tangent line. A tangent line is a different curve. So you should use a different coordinate to parameterize it. Use a different coordinate for the tangent line. Use a different parameter. Usually, we, uh, we can utilize the letter S, say TS, but you can use whatever you want. So for example, in this particular case, if you take the derivatives, the value of the derivatives at t equals 0, you will get 2, 1, and negative 1. And so the equation of the tangent line is going to be 1 plus 2s, 1 plus s, and z is 1 minus s. That, these are the equations of the tangent line. OK, so we'll continue on Thursday.